Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of The Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of The Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, I have a pleasure to have a novelist. We're going to talk about his books, and we talk about his last book, The Last Prophet. Jeff Horton, you can call in at 347-324-3460, 347-324-3460, or you can pose a question in the chat room and we'll read it on the air. Jeff, welcome to the program. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Well, I guess to begin with, our listeners like to hear personal stories about the person the versus reading a bio. So kind of tell us about yourself and how did you gravitate to become a novelist? Well, that's a great question. I um, I have was in the and still am in the IT industry for about oh twenty five twenty six years, and it's been it's been a great business to be in. But I started examining probably several years ago what would I really like to do, what would I and really enjoy doing if I had a choice for the second half. Of of my career, and I thought, well, I've, I've kind of enjoyed the times in the past where I've written. I had a creative writing course in college. And I enjoyed that. I just it was nothing that I ever really pursued, and so I decided I could something that I could do on the side, something I could start up with, uh, kind of as a hobby. And if it goes somewhere at some point, awesome. And if it doesn't, that's okay. It's still fun, and so. I and I have found, i got to tell you, that I just really enjoy it. I never realized it's kind of the inner. I've, I have channeled my inner artist, I guess, so to speak. I really just enjoy the pure creativity of writing. Particularly, you know, I don't think I necessarily enjoy writing anything as much as I do a novel. The mm-hmm. opportunity to create, a, create an entire landscape and characters and personalities and events. It's just pure creativity. And I was, in fact, just explaining, I think, to my wife or my daughter yesterday that it's, well, I, I certainly appreciate all the other arts, like art forms, sculpting, painting, you know, that kind of thing as well. I get to use words. And really, um, I can develop a lot more and explain a lot more and say a lot more in a novel than I ever could with a a single work of art. Okay. And painting that in your mentally, a whole novel, how does that come to you? I mean, do you have it all lined out or you have an outline where you want to go or outline where you want to end? How do you put that all in perspective and writing a book that's going to take you from the beginning to the end and have this story so vividly in your head? Well, it's been a, it's been a, a, a growing, a learning process, a growing process for me. And I think that from talking with different authors, people do it somewhat differently. I generally will start with a basic idea, with a basic premise, something that I really want to kind of speak to. And then I will will start kind of growing that. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll map out <clears throat> a rough outline kind of, of what I, the book is going to be about. Uh, then I'll really get started, and I'll start writing, and just kind of, it's kind of really, it's interesting because I, and I've talked with other writers the same way that a lot of times these characters and events tend to take on a life of their own. It's almost like you're just kind of writing down what you're seeing or hearing or something that's already occurred. It's not necessarily. <laughs> it's kind of. I know it, it might sound a little esoteric, but it's kind of really, it's kind of true. And, and so what I find is I'll hit a point. A lot of times I may have gotten as far as several chapters or maybe a third my way through the novel. And I, now I have a really good idea uh, kind of where the story's going. And I can go in and I can fill in the blanks in the outline and the chapters. And I try to do that so that I can 
always know where I'm at. And I find writing that way gives me a, a little bit more of a chance to craft a message if I'm trying to send one. I'm working on a novel now, for example. It's actually my fifth, not my fourth, called Cyberspace is the tentative name for it. And I'm one of the underlying themes I hope people will see when they read this is the whole concept of fear and mistrust. A lack of trust can often lead to violence, particularly in, in, in the world stage between nations. And uh, it's that fear that often separates us, you know, fear of one another, fear of what might happen. And that's kind of a constant theme that I return to in this novel. So writing where I have an outline, where I have an idea of where I'm going, and then I'll get it started. And once it's kind of on a roll, I know better where it's going. And once I know better where it's going, I can make sure that I insert throughout the story the key points I'm trying to get across. Because ultimately, I think that writing has to, one, have some kind of a message, particularly with a novel some type of a message, and it's really good if you're sharing information or providing knowledge that the reader didn't have before. So like in this current novel, I'm going out, I, you have to research when you're when you're writing these things, because all of my novels revolve around, at least to this point, events that could happen today, tomorrow, or a few years from now, as opposed to some distant corner of a galaxy a thousand years from now. I mean, everything's kind of based somewhat, grounded somewhat in reality. And mm -hmm. and so this, I'm working right now, I had, a, I had a research a little bit about there's some involvement of the former Soviet Union in Russia. And I wasn't aware that I wanted to involve Russian intelligence. And naturally, I think the KGB, but actually the KGB kind of went away. Now it's called the FSB. When the the fall of communism in the 90s. So uh, providing that kind of information, talking a little bit about that, I'll go ahead and I'll research, okay, how is the FSB structured? Kind of uh, and start providing. And so it's a little bit of a learning experience for the reader. Wow. So out of your five books, uh, three are sequential. They follow a certain order. And then two are just totally dependent. I think just kind of recap real quick the first three books that you wrote. Sure. And yeah, and the first three books, the first one that I actually started writing and, uh, is, is The Dark Age. It's actually the second one that was published. And uh, it was my first my, my first completed novel. I'd had a few false starts before. And, uh, and, and it was set 500 years from now, around the year 2525. 25, and uh, it's a post-apocalyptic landscape and... People are carrying swords and riding around on horses because there's no electricity anymore anywhere in the world. Nothing will operate that's electric. And civilization was basically thrown back 500,000 years. And so I wrote that one first. And then I wrote, I went back and someone, I was talking to someone, a friend of mine about, about the book. And he said, well, it'd be really interesting to, to read about you know, how humanity got in that situation, got to that point. So I went and I wrote. The Great Collapse. So The Great Collapse is set pretty much in modern times. It could be now or I mean, 15, 20 years from now. It's kind of how it, it's actually set in 2025. I mean, but it's, it could be today, uh, today or tomorrow. And The Great Collapse is about uh, the there is a electromagnetic pulse weapon that's designed by the United States but not implemented. And a terrorist hired by Iran basically steal this weapon and want to use it to attack the United States as a step you know, prior to actually war, attacking the U.S., thinking to knock out all of our power, which would certainly cripple us, and then followed by an, an attack. Uh, but what happens is a large, uh, the weapon's much more powerful than they knew. There's a, a solar flare that comes at the same time, and the two interact and basically trap this this EMP effect in the Earth's magnetic field so that nothing that runs on electricity will operate. And so the Great Collapse basically chronicles from right before that happens, during that happening, and, you know, how people deal with it, and then, you know, a little bit how they survive uh, afterwards. And then the Dark Age picks up with that. 
and, and until uh, and provides a conclusion to the story and civilization may or may not come back as a result of what happens in the dark age. The, the last prophet is set, uh, again, in, it could be um, today or tomorrow, but it's based on chapter 11 in the book of Revelation in the Bible. It's about the two last prophets, the two witnesses that are mentioned in that chapter that do battle with the, the Antichrist or the beast. And I wrote the last prophet. One of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to I wanted to capture what I thought it might be like to be one of those two witnesses, to be the prophet who's going to be a, instrumental in God's plan for the end of the world and uh, the, apoc- the apocalypse. And uh, so I have I have uh, I named the character John March, and he ends up. Uh, having to come to grips with the fact that he has been chosen by a guy. He's an ordinary guy, and he finds out he's been chosen by God for this thing. He doubts his ability. He questions his, you know, his role, and uh, he struggles. He has doubts, and he's impacted when his family is sort of attacked by the, the Antichrist and how he has to deal with that. So it's all around those kind of issues up until the, the second coming. So that that book is very biblically oriented. I tried to be as faithful as I could to uh, the chronicling of Revelation as I could. The fourth book, it hasn't been published, but it's pretty much done and ready. I'm just waiting to see on some things. I've still got a few more changes to make to it, actually, before I, I want to release it, but it's pretty much done. It's called Tales of Eden, and uh, I see it as kind of a Christian allegory similar to Chronicles of Narnia, but maybe with a little bit mm-hmm. of Pilgrim's Progress thrown in. And uh, there's four children. Their father is killed by a storm, and uh, they are out one day playing in the backyard, and they find themselves transported to another world. And the only way they can get home is to find this relic, uh, Nacor, when I call it, and uh, they have to find this relic and this relic can help them get back home. So there's, but they have to pass seven trials, which turn out to be the seven deadly sins. They have hmm. to their their group is challenged along the way and along this road. It's actually a road called the Way of Nacor. So that's kind of I don't give away too much, but that's kind of the tales of Eden. And then I mentioned already this the fifth one called uh, Cyberspace, which I'm working on. Wow. So what where do you get your inspiration in your books? I'm sorry, what's that? Where do you get your inspiration for the books? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. The first one, I decided I wanted to sit down and write a novel. I, I have an, you're, You either write about things that you know a lot about or things that you have an interest in. And so I wrote, I wrote, a, I wanted to write about something that involved maybe politics. I like the idea of some feudal martial art type fighting. And so the Dark Age, kind of a good genesis to that. And then politics I have some interest in, so the the Great Collapse involves a little bit of that in terms of the conflict with Iran and terrorists, and it has that, again, very relevant to today's headlines. And, mm-hmm. and then The Last Prophet, I've always loved the imagery in the Bible, particularly in Revelation, such vivid imagery. Is it symbolic? Is it not? Is there a rapture? Is there not? I don't. I'm not necessarily trying to make the, the last prophet any kind of a work of theology. It's more of a story that I hope both Christians and non-Christians can enjoy reading and and have based on feedback that I've gotten on it. But so I just was always fascinated with that. Cyberspace was born initially, or I'm sorry, Tales of Eden. Again, I love the Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. All the different books, my kids have loved it, and uh, you know, uh, and J.R.R. Tolkien, who who wrote The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, initially with his goal was my children's book. Now it may go a little bit beyond that too, but so I, I thought I, I wanted to kind of try and do something like that too, and so I wrote Tales of Eden, a very fantasy type story, which breaks a little bit with my real life kind of stuff, but. 
that's meant to be an, an allegory. And so, uh, and then, but then cyberspace was born out of my background in IT, you know, and just, uh, you know, the recent events, the cyber attacks have been more and more predominant. All the secrets that have been stolen, particularly mm-hmm. from the United States by China, perhaps Russia and others. So I was very, uh, just thought that would make a great, a great book. And, uh, but the difference with cyberspace is it's going to also have a little bit of science fiction thrown in. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'll, I've, I've got a little twist in there that I think uh, I try to, you, every artist wants to try and do something slightly different. So I, I'm no exception. Wow. How do you define your particular style? <sighs> How do I define it? Probably organic. You know, I'm, I'm a very wow. organic writer. You, know, you start mm-hmm. writing and as I mentioned, I start writing, and the story often kind of takes on a life of its own. It uh, it develops and grows, and uh, that's just I really enjoy writing that way. It's not I'm, I don't have the complete story from end to end fleshed out in an outline form and that kind of thing before I start. I, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. I do develop that as I go along, but a lot of it's organic. It just kind of grows. Wow, who inspired you when you were growing up to kind of? Everyone has someone that they look towards, artists or a writer or a musician and so forth. Who did you look up in the past as you were growing up? Hey, I want to be that particular person. I like his particular style. Who influenced um, you? That's a, that's a good question. I've always, most writers you'll find, most authors are, were also avid readers growing up. And I was no exception. I I, I read Sherlock Holmes, I think everything about him when I was younger and I loved it. So certainly Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had an influence. Tar, I think Tarzan, Tarzan of the Apes, Edgar Rice Burroughs was probably one of my first books that I read when I was really little and I, and I certainly was impacted by that along with H.G. Wells, and Jules Verne, Charles Dickens and, uh, uh, you know, all these guys, I uh, just really enjoyed their work. Uh, I think more contemporary authors that really influenced me were probably Michael Crichton and Tom Clancy. Wow. I just, yeah, I really enjoy, I'm, I've gone back and I'm reading, I saw the movie probably 10, 15 years ago, but I'm reading Patriot Games now, and Clancy is such a master at drawing you in. I was, I was just absolutely sucked in after, uh, I think, uh, reading through the first or second chapter. But, you know, his style, you mentioned, asked a minute ago about style, and I haven't followed this. The Last Prophet is in first person. So I, I kind of shift around viewpoints. H.G. Wells did that, too. He, I think he wrote The Invisible Man in the first person. Several, several of the others he used more of an omniscient kind of or third person. I, I like <clears throat> The Great Collapse and The Dark Age are both written similar to Clancy's method of you have several different plot points or several different storylines that later on will converge maybe somewhere midway, two-thirds way in the story. All the different plot lines will converge. And several of my books are that way. In, in fact, cyberspace is somewhat that way as well. And I like that. It makes it a little more complex to read. And some people like that and some don't. Some, even though my own family, really like The Last Prophet because it's very sequential. And it's always in the first person, whereas uh, the other ones are a little bit more difficult to follow what's going on as they all come together. But So Clancy was definitely a, a, a big influence. Wow. We're going to take a station break real quick and we'll be back in a moment. Again, with Jeff Harden, novelist Jeff Harden. We'll be back in one moment. We'll take a station break from our sponsor. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. 
Welcome back to the core. Once again, here's Tim Japan. We're back with Jeff, novelist Jeff Horton. We talk about his series of books. Jeff, any advice would you give to a person who's coming through, who's in college or someone who's looking to write? What do they really need to do and to make that first leap of faith, that step to become a a novelist or an author? And how they, should they approach publishing companies? Should they self-publish? Uh, can you talk about that if you don't mind? Sure. Well, that's that's really difficult to address because the industry is in such change right now from what I can see. I'd say, first of all, I, I remember I read a book by, um, I think his name is Donald Mass. He's a literary agent up in New York, a very successful one. And he wrote a book called Writing the Breakout Novel. Yeah, I think that's a great book for someone who's interested in, in writing novels to read. And then how, what are people looking for? What makes a novel more successful than another? But and he talks about some of the issues like the move from paper to more electronic ebooks and that kind of thing. So the whole publishing industry, and that all ties into whether you self-publish or you go through a traditional publisher, you get some that are, they're called indies, right? Very outspoken. You get to keep more of the profits or well, the books that you make, that you write. I mean, so there's definitely a, a real upside to that. One of the downsides is so many that it's all about getting above the noise level. It's, just, it's marketing 101. How do you get, how do you, how do people learn about your book? You got to, you know, people have to learn who you are. They have to, they have to know that your book is out there and they have to know that's something that they should look at. I mean, that that's really, and that's marketing. Publishing companies don't probably do as much marketing for authors as maybe they once did. And they're starting to really embrace the whole electronic media a little bit more. All of my books are through publishers. The Great Collapse was through Tate Publishing. And The Dark Age and The Last Prophet were both through World Press. And they there's a lot of benefit, I think, through going through traditional publishers versus the indie. But if you go indie, I mean, again, you get to keep most of the profits. You have to work really hard on doing the marketing yourself, and you have to you can use social media. I'm out there fairly regularly on on Facebook, book blogs, Twitter, Goodreads, which is a, a, a website you know, pretty much for avid book readers okay. and uh, library thing. So anybody who's really wanting to kind of get into it, they need to uh, they need to read books like. The one I mentioned by Donald Mass, writing a breakout novel, and they need to learn how to. There's a very, there's a very specific way that you have to go about contacting agents and publishers. If you want to get with the big publishers, most of them will only talk to literary agents. Now, getting okay. a literary agent and getting a literary agent is almost as hard as getting a publisher. It's really <laughs> difficult because they're. It's true. I mean, they're really tough to to get. So why is um, that? Well, I think it's because there's so many people writing. There's more books being written now than ever before. And, and you got to keep in mind, the agent makes his living off of a percentage of book sales. And so he's got to pretty much leverage his, you know, he's gambling that this uh, particular author is going to be successful or that he's going to be able to help make that author successful so they can both make a good uh, a, a good living off the writing. So he has kind of a vested interest. And they are the gateway, again, into a lot of the, the, the large publishers. now. If you go indie and you do it yourself, you don't have to worry about agents or publishers. You just go out to Amazon, and the Amazon has a program where you get to keep, I think it's, you can keep up to 70% because it's all electronic. And then when you start talking about the print media, you get less. I mean, of course, anytime you're printing the book, it's always more expensive than an ebook. But And then in terms of you have to write query letters. You have to really learn how to concisely put into one page or even a paragraph, in some cases, even a few sentences. If you're writing a query letter either to an agent or to a publisher, you have to be very specific, and you have to really try to hook them. I mean, there's a whole – yeah, I was really surprised by the formality of the whole process. And if you don't have a good query letter, publishers will just absolutely not even look at it half the time. I mean, it has mm -hmm. to be – because you're looking at a grad student – you're looking at somebody who kind of sorts through, it's called a slush pile. You know, all the manuscripts that come in or all the query letters that come in, someone who works at a literary agency or someone who works at a publisher will go through these 
And they'll say, okay, it looks interesting. doesn't look interesting. The guy can't write a good query letter, so he probably can't write a good novel. You know, how they look at it. Mm -hmm. So they, if the query letter, if you got, you got grammatical errors, if it's, your ideas aren't clear, I, they'll put it in the, in the trash can. So it's tough to really break into that. And again, some will say, why even do it? Why not go indie to begin with? Why do you really need an agent or a publisher in today's market? But I think there's still a lot of value there and, and having an agent, having someone to go to bat for you in a way that a lot of writers are not necessarily the real salesy type. And marketing is something that a lot of us find somewhat distasteful. This is necessary mm -hmm. evil that we do. <laughs> but Okay. Uh, to close out real quick, can you take something out of one of the passages of your books or your recent one and I guess read something out of it that really speaks to who you are as an author or you just want to share with one of a paragraph out of your book or something? Well, sure. There is a, in The Last Prophet, in Chapter 1, I'll just read a brief excerpt from there, if I may, about a paragraph. I have a quote at the beginning of it that reads, There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Of course, that's from Hamlet, William Shakespeare. And then the chapter starts, Life is only a brief stop on the road to eternity. Our loved ones, acquaintances, and strangers pass away before our very eyes on a daily basis. Yet each of us carries on with our lives as if we will live forever. This is merely an illusion, of course, as it is an inevitable consequence of life that each of us must die. Nevertheless, we blindly follow the music of the piper of this world, progressing steadily on our journey toward the end. We go about life in a dreamlike stupor, living only for the day and for the dollar. We live so in France and enamored with worldly pleasures and concerns that we become completely oblivious of what awaits us all. We ignore the truth of our mortality at our own peril, however, when we choose to focus on this brief and temporal existence called life, while continuing steadily on our journey toward the eternal existence that awaits us all. It was when humanity lost, thought, lost sight of these truths that it became so susceptible to the deception that was to come, despite having already been warned of the coming of apocalypse. So that was from chapter one of The Last Prophet. Wow. So, uh, uh, well, how, yeah, that, and, go ahead. I was saying that sets the stage for, I think, the rest of the novel. The fact that our outlook and in our culture, and, and not just in the United States, but really worldwide, has changed uh, such that it's almost set up the imperfect environment for the coming of the Antichrist. So. Wow. Well, that's a powerful statement. You also have a website. Can you direct us to your website? And if you have Facebook and Twitter, if they want to take a look at your other books or excerpts of the other books? Oh, absolutely. And the excerpts, uh, they can read uh, They can read chapters and uh, by going to Amazon. But my website is easy to remember. It's hortonlibrary.com, H-O-R-T-O-N-L-I-B-R-A-R-Y.com. And mm -hmm. uh, I have links there to my Facebook and to my Twitter uh, Goodreads. There's actually some excerpts there about each novel, and as well as how people can order them. I think uh, Amazon you can get it for like three bucks or something in e-book, so it's not real pricey at all. And that's that wow. way for all three of them. But yeah, and I got uh, again Facebook, Twitter. Love to hear from uh, from fans or potential fans. Very perfect. Well, we're gonna leave it at that, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming out to the program and talking about your novels and sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Tim. I'm very appreciative. Have a great day. Same here. Take care. Again, it's been another production of The Core Business Show with Tim J.K. You can download this episode on iTunes on Block Talk Radio, or you can get off of blog.applecapital.com. Everybody, thank you for listening today. We do ask you to write reviews or Google Plus these particular episodes so we can get a feedback if these, these shows are meeting your needs. Thank you for listening. Everybody, have a great day. and Stay tuned. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.